John er journalist og fast klogskemand for CNN, og han har vundet en række priser, blandt andet en Livingstone Award og en Peabody Award, og så er han også blevet nomineret til en Emmy for en dokumentarfilm. Øh, og han er founder på det her Change the List Project, også Two Degrees projektet, som CNN også står bag. Øh, og det skal han fortælle sig mere om, men det er sådan nogle projekter, hvor at brugerne øh, er med til at influere, hvad der bliver skrevet. Så det er lidt ligesom vores idé for os, så det er derfor, vi synes, det er super spændende. Øh, det vil jeg gerne fortælle os om nu. John, take away! Thank you so much for the introduction. I, 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 I caught Peabody. <laughs> I caught my name. Um, I, but yeah, I, I'm very uh, honored to be able to be here um, to speak with you all. And I think that it's exciting what, what Publish is um, doing here in Denmark. I think it, it echoes what um, you know a lot of us are trying to do all around the world to put people more in the driver's seat of journalism to try to use journalism as a way to actually bring about um, change. So when I when I heard about you know what was going on here, I, I, I thought it sounded very exciting, and, and that's you know how I, I ended up here. And I, I was asked to talk a little bit about um, my work at CNN, which for the last several years has been really focused on uh, having our audience uh, drive my coverage, and in a lot of cases, people vote on the issues that I go out and cover, um, or I ask them in very specific ways to get involved with. The reporting as it's as it's going on, and so I'm going to um, show you. If we go back. Oh, okay. Here's the beginning. <laughs> um, so when I, uh, I, I was talking to Ulrich about um, about this talk, and and he he sort of asked this question in uh, a slightly different phrasing, but the idea of like what happens when you ask people to be part of the storytelling process. Um, and I think there are lots of ways that that can happen, and so I'm going to go through uh, just a handful of things that, that I've, I've seen in my own work um, in terms of inviting people into the stories. So the first um, point that I would make is that you get smarter ideas. I think journalists often, um, maybe this is an American perspective, but there are a lot of news editors who think that they have a monopoly on deciding what is important in the world and what issues people uh, need to read about and hear about. And, and I do think that there's an extremely important role uh, for that and for editorial judgment. I'm not suggesting do away with that, but I'm, I'm suggesting invite people into it and, and strengthen it in that way. Um, I started this project at CNN uh, called Change the List, uh, and we asked our audience to vote um, for topics that they wanted me to go out in the world and cover, and then the construct was that they would pick an issue, um, like income inequality was the issue that they voted on here, and then I would go to the bottom of the list place, so to speak. So I, in this case, I went to the county in the U.S. that had the highest level of income inequality and did um, a story from there. Um, so here you can see, like, that here's a column that I wrote talking about this poll that we did and the number of votes that came in for each of these topics. And I think one question that my editors had going into this, because this was new for CNN, like we'd never tried this before, and this was maybe five years ago or four years ago when we started this, and so this idea of people commissioning work was, was really new and got a lot of criticism, actually. Um, uh, but they picked topics that were of a lot of social relevance in the US, and the reason I'm showing this, this income inequality win is because that's a topic that I never would have chosen to write about just personally. Like I, I come from more of a science writing background um, and I you know I, I thought that there had been so much written about income inequality at that point that there was not a lot that I would be able to add to that conversation. But I really saw in this vote the wisdom of the crowd and and actually going out to the county with the highest level of income inequality in the States. I really realized, you know, how stark this issue was, and and also sort of, you know, why it was on so many people's minds. And so I'm just going to show you like a little clip from the start of the video that we produced from this place, um, just again to get a sense of this is something that came about only because our readers selected it. I just pray that the Holy Spirit will just move one night over this town. You have to sit back and think, why is God keeping this town alive? If we're 
the poorest, and if we have the highest unemployment crime rate, why won't God say, I'm just going to go ahead and wipe this town off? They're, they're useless. It's because he knows that there is definitely hope here. That's why he's keeping us, because he believes, and he's waiting for us to start to believe in ourselves. This corner of Louisiana, near the Mississippi River, is a place of great natural wealth. Of cypress trees and cornfields, and a lake so beautiful, they named it Providence. But there's a curse this community can't shake. It's the most economically divided place in America. My journey to Lake Providence, Louisiana, started with an online vote. This summer, you picked income inequality as the top social justice issue of our time, and asked me to cover it as part of CNN's Change the List project. The goal of the project, as the name suggests, is to get um, CNN's audience So I think, uh, you know, as you see, like, in the setup of this piece, I think it's important to reflect what you're doing. Like, if you're inviting people, uh, you know, in to commission your work or asking for their input, telling them, you know, the thing you voted for is now a story on CNN, or the, you know, the story that you suggested or funded on published, like, that, you know, that actually became a real thing. Because I think you got to think about when you're inviting people into the storytelling and journalism process, like, what's in it for them? And, and I think that is really one key thing, is that they can see the results of their involvement. So um, the second thing that I think happens when you invite people into the story is that you um, build momentum. Like if, if you're posting a, you know, a pitch online and asking people to fund it or upvote it or however the, you know, it's working technically, you're um, creating a sense of anticipation for the work. And if you tell people about your reporting as it's happening, I would argue you, you know, can strengthen the end product because you basically have this built-in audience of people who are already excited about what you're doing and invested in it. So here is, that's a map. Um, so one of the other issues that Change the List readers voted on was on rivers in America. And I, I spent three weeks kayaking down the San Joaquin River in California, which at the time was named the most endangered river in the country. This was during the height of the drought in California. <laughs> so there were, you know, this goes through the most productive farmland in that state. Um, and so you could really see the results of this drought. And the, the fact that this river, you can see this, this midsection where there are dots, is like a 40 mile stretch, um, where the river was just completely dry. It was just like a sand bed. It, so it started out, oh, this is, <laughs> this is just to say like, I, 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 so I told people, I, you know, you voted on the story, I'm going on this journey to try to tell the story of this river. And I, I let people in on like how much of a novice I was and how I had no idea what I was doing. Like I had to get a kayaking lesson in this, kayaking rental shop before I headed out on this trip. Um, this is the start of the river up in the Sierra Nevada mountains. And then this is the midsection, um, this riverbed that was completely dry. And I think the fact that I, I was, I, I started posting about this um, on uh, Twitter and Instagram. And uh, I sort of got this following of people who were interested in you know, whether I was going to die on this river, like if I was going to make it. But then along the way, I also hopefully taught people something about California water issues, um, about the drought, and about the people who are affected by that in, in a, bunch of different, uh, a bunch of different ways. So I think um, the moral here is like, if you tell people what you're up to and you ask for their help, um, then that can aid your reporting in surprising ways. So in this case, like I had no idea that this was going to happen, but people started following like the geolocation on my tweets and actually finding me on the river. So I was like floating down the river and all of a sudden I hear this woman yelling like, are you John? And, <laughs> and I like look up and probably like 10 meters up was this woman on top of this water tower whose family had had a farm um, in the California Delta for like 100 years. And you know, I stopped and heard her story and that made it into the piece that I wrote. And, and I never would have found her if she, if I hadn't publicized the fact that I was on this trip and that I wanted help trying to learn the story of this place. And then, like, sort of more tangibly helpful, like, I, I had these science teachers that met me, they were standing on a bridge and I went under it and they, they hollered down at me, 
and they like brought me a burrito for dinner and they oh. and they told me about like the fact that they bring their middle school uh, age uh, science students out to the water to try to, to try to teach them about the connection uh, that they have to it. So this is a tweet that this that guy posted. Um, and there's the end of that journey. That's me in like the orange under that's the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. Um, so point three is somewhat related, but you get help with the reporting. Um, I, I like to invite people on social media to suggest questions to ask like public officials or even just general people. So I did a, a, the, the project that, that came after Change the List was called Two Degrees, and I basically tried to apply the same thinking about um, crowdsourcing story topics and uh, selection to the issue of climate change. We did a year of stories about the two degrees threshold for warming and the lead up to the Paris climate talks at the end of last year. Um, and so one of, and so we started that out as like this open question, like what do you want to know about the two degrees goal or about climate change? And we got, I think in the thousands of questions, and then we, I kind of collect, group them into like themes. So this, this, this theme was about like, what does the world look like at two degrees of warming? Um, and uh, we collected some of the best questions and had a Facebook poll uh, where they upvoted this question about the disappearing coast, where do, where do climate refugees go as the seas rise? And that led me to the Marshall Islands, um, and I discovered something that I, I, again, would have never come to this story had someone not, someone in California just wrote in with that question, um, that people were already moving from the Marshall Islands way out in the Pacific to Arkansas in the middle of the U.S. because, in some cases, for a couple families because of flooding. And so I ended up doing this story about this family that was split between these two very different places. Um, because of flooding and because of the higher tides that they've been experiencing on the islands. Mm -hmm. The Marshall Islands is one of the places that is expected to not exist at two degrees of warming, basically because the seas are expected to rise above their land. Um, so in, in terms of the reader input, uh, I, I was on this story posting on Snapchat while I was in the field, and, and I did that for like a reason that's probably too theoretical or like meta for its own good, I, I thought like, okay, th this is a disappearing medium and this is a disappearing place. And I thought if I post <laughs> these stories of like life and culture in this place that's going to be gone in a disappearing format, that maybe that helps underscore it. But I, the one positive thing that happened out of that is people started asking me just kind of general questions. So someone wrote in one day and said, you know, what language do they speak? Like, what is the language like there? And that led to this just sort of little mini Snapchat story that I, that I posted, and I think these little like snippets of life actually ended up being some of the more meaningful parts of this reporting, even though they weren't the sort of big, you know, magazine style story. Oh, I think there's a, it's a video. Yeah, there's a video on that. One. <coughs> journalism and of journalists. I don't think that we should just be out there 
sharing stories of doom and gloom, you know, till the end, I think it's our duty to, to try to help, uh, you know, give our readers a way to be involved in the story if they want to be. And just really quickly, I won't go into all the details, but like, um, here's a story where the, I think that worked. It surprised me how well it worked. I don't know, do any of you recognize that animal? It's sort of a weird... No, it, it looks like an armadillo. It's, it's, a, it's, it's called a pangolin. What's that? Um, it's, a, it's a scale covered anteater that they're found. Uh, there are eight species, four in Southeast Asia, four in Africa. And they're trafficked, they're thought to be the most trafficked mammal in the world. It's an illegal trade for their scales, which are used in traditional um, medicine, and for their meat, which is a delicacy. So it's, it's less lucrative than the rhino trade like by volume, but it, you know, per like kilo of product, but um, the, the scope of it is huge. I mean, they're like 20 ton shipments that have been intercepted of frozen pangolins. Um, and so this was another change to the story. People voted on a wildlife trade uh, story, and, and I went out and reported on it. Um, and as part of that, you know, tried to I asked NGOs and people who are experts, you know, how can people get involved? Um, what would be useful? Um, and one thing that came out of that is that this woman in California uh, read the story and decided she wanted to start a petition on change.org telling Disney to put a pangolin in an animated movie. Because <laughs> she thought that that rightly would like give them more publicity and awareness and that that would help save the species that, like biologists were worrying that they would go extinct before anyone even knew that they existed. Um, and actually, Disney wouldn't ever comment on this, but a pangolin was a character, like a sideshow character in the Jungle Book, which came out earlier this year. And I, I think that that has something to do with that. I mean, she delivered thousands of petitions printed them out and delivered them to Disney, so they definitely knew about it. Um, the other thing that happened is I asked an NGO that was in Vietnam when I was in the field, like, okay, you know, you guys have no funding to do anything related to pangolins, like, what would help you? And he said just immediately, there are all these public service announcements for tigers or for rhinos and, you know, these more charismatic, well-known animals. I wish we could make a public service announcement about pangolins. And so I put that out there in my column, and these readers who had voted on the story and were following along donated something like $20,000, $25,000 to the creation of a pangolin PSA that aired nationally in <laughs> Vietnam. And I was told that this is like An the Anderson Cooper of Vietnam. <laughs> and she's a newscaster who, who fronted this video um, that aired there because people wanted to get involved. And then like two weeks ago at the CITES conference, is this big, you know, UN International Conference on Wildlife Trade, this uh, international body voted to give all pangolin species their highest level of protection. And WWF, the, the environment group, was crediting, like, the fact that our audience had gotten so involved in this and raised awareness and raised the profile of the pangolin for being one of the reasons that this was, um, a, you know, a legal change that was made. So th that doesn't always work. Like, people don't always get you know, excited about pushing for change as much as happened in this case. But I think like being open, asking the question and inviting them in ups the odds that something like this will happen every now and then. And then finally, um, I'll just say that like giving people the opportunity to rally around the story, even if it's symbolic, I, I think is powerful. And again, I think this all flows from asking people up front to, you know, be involved in commissioning or funding a work. Um, this is a, a, a documentary that I worked on a few years ago about slavery in Mauritania in West Africa. And we um, gave people uh, sort of a, a prompt, a way to, um, to contribute videos of their own. So as part of that documentary, we featured the school, which was for escaped or liberated slaves. Um, and it gave them tr job training and tried to help them sort of get back on, <coughs> on their feet for the first time in the economy. Um, and we wanted people, again, I sort of asked them what would be useful, and, and they were like, people don't, they don't know that people around the world care about this issue and, and support them. Um, and so we started this campaign online to have people send in um, short messages of hope. And I will just play just a little bit of this, but keep in mind these are, you know, uh, these videos are from CNN's audience all around the world. CNN recently published a special investigation about slavery in the Saharan country of Mauritania. 
In the report, we introduced you to a group of escaped and liberated slaves who are learning new skills to support themselves now that they are free. We asked CNN's iReport community to record messages of hope to send to these women. We wanted to show them that people all around the world support them in their progress. The messages begin with the phrase in Hassania, the language these women speak. Nahna ma'akum. Nahna means we. Ma'akum means we are with you. So you say first, Nahna ma'akum. So simple, right? Nahna ma'akum. Nahna ma'akum. Nahna to the women of Mauritania, uh, every person in this world is created equally, and that is my belief. I want you to know that all of us are so proud of you for how strong you are. There are people here thinking about you every single day and will continue to fight with you. We're always thinking of you. Nahana Ma'akum. We are with you. My ancestors, the enslaved living in America, you sing. Oh, oh, freedom, oh, oh, freedom. This beautiful flower is for the women of Mauritania. I am very happy to hear that the word freedom is already in my hands. All of you deserve to be happy, to be free, and to have a better place to live in. Oh, yeah, that's a good question. That's one key that I can tell you that we knew. So, um, again, I think it's it's about like extending the invitation for people to be involved in the coverage, and, and often, um, like what results from that is more interesting than anything like you know that we could come up with in a boardroom brainstorming. How are we going to cover something? Um, I'm often so very happily surprised by submissions we get when we do ask for them, and and by like the ideas that people have when you open open it up. Um, you know, two people uh, having input in the work that you do. And again, I'm not, I'm not saying that like journalists can't ever decide like this is something that's important and I don't care if people vote for it, I'm going out and doing it because that I still think is an essential function of journalism. But I think that, um, that our stories will travel farther, have more impact, and be more meaningful to people, which is the whole point, right? You want someone to take meaning from your work if you invite them into the whole process. And that, that's again why I'm excited to be here tonight. And, and, um, hear about all this work that, that you all are doing. So um, that is my presentation. If you all, I, I don't know how I am on time, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to take a couple. So this is a very lovely project, very intriguing. And I'm going to challenge you a bit. Okay. Uh, and I don't mean to be sassy, but you're from CNN. You have uh, an audience that is probably bigger than the whole population of Denmark. <laughs> Uh, so you have a volume that you can go out asking these questions and ask to list. What is your, what would you recommend a media like as Pepperidge that is uh, still a small upcoming media, the volume is a big challenge, I think you would agree to get uh, enough followers. What would you advise people to do when they try to bring up media like this? I think it's a really fair question and I do have, I mean that's a huge cheat that I have just built into my job is that <laughs> there's this big megaphone. Um, but I, I do think like one way to do it is to look at the topic and on any topic say wildlife trafficking. There are dozens if not hundreds of social media accounts of people who are expert in that field, leading that conversation, and have the dedicated, obsessive following that is what you really want to, to be following projects like these. So for one of the challenges of Change the List, honestly, was that the topics varied so widely. I mean, one was on a river, one was on inequality, one was on rape. Uh, they were just wildly different sets of people who would be very passionate about those topics. And so for everyone, I would try to look both locally, like where I was doing the reporting, and internationally, like who is, uh, who are the leading voices on income inequality, and reaching out to them, and if I was interviewing them, like say, hey, I'm, you know, this is what I'm trying to do, and I'm trying to get people involved in it, you know, anyone who might be able to amplify that. Because CNN does have a very broad audience, but doesn't necessarily, you know, isn't, might not have the depth in any of these subject areas that, that some others would. So I'd say looking out for allies and people who you can learn from and then also you know who can help spread the word about, about what you're doing. 
and just saying that you need help, like saying like, you know, to pull this off, uh, I, you know, I need these kinds of things. These are the things that I don't know. I think being vulnerable and admitting that you know that you could use assistance with something is a good rallying cry to get people to come to you and want to provide that assistance. I think the internet is full of people who want to be more helpful when when they're asked. But still, say goodbye. Last one too. This one. I'm just saying we've got time for one more question or two more questions. Um, actually, I, I know about your work from before. I read about um, your your travel down the the river and how you use Snapchat as well in order to engage with the, with the new audiences. And I think I remember that actually you got a lot of new followers on the, on Snapchat, uh, or uh, or at least. I think I, re I remember that you said something about being able to communicate <coughs> with other kinds of people that you normally do, like younger people, people who might usually, you know, read your, your articles. Yeah, I, um, yeah, Snapchat in particular, I mean, I, I don't know how, uh, how popular it is here relative to in the U.S., but like it's, it's gotten very, very popular in the U.S., especially among younger people who also are the people who tend to be more interested in environmental Topics. And so when I was doing the Two Degrees project, I, not exclusively, but I very heavily focused on Snapchat in part um, because those are the people that I wanted to try to reach. Uh, and I got, I mean, that was like starting from zero following and with a little bit of help from CNN every now and then saying like, there's this guy doing this thing, you could follow him. But I, I think it was more, it just sort of built organically over the course of the year. I got a lot of people who would very instantly um, reply to almost anything I posted and they would like doodle like the island getting covered with water, they would doodle like like uh, pictures that I'd taken, they'd put little like thought bubbles with questions that they wanted me to ask. Um, I interviewed the foreign minister of the Marshall Islands and put on Snapchat like a little video when I was setting up the camera shot like hey I'm about to interview this guy, what do you want to ask him? And within like a minute or two, I had a couple dozen questions, a lot of them really good ones. And then I told people like, hey, at whatever your Snapchat name is, like I asked your question, here's what he said. Because um, I think the more people can see like, oh, if I'm interacting with this guy, I become part of his reporting and it's not just he's asking these questions and doesn't care. Like I, I would screen grab what they were sending me and then, and then sort of refer back to it. Um, so yeah, I think you can build a. Rep I think trying new platforms is another way to build an audience. And, and when something new like Snapchat, which isn't especially new anymore, but like the new new thing, jumping on there and just experimenting with it, like people, uh, you know, gravitate towards, uh, you know, towards that. I think. So. One final question. Did you run into problems with your editor, uh, Marshall Islands? It used to be. A place for nuclear uh, testing of America. Could you have made a, a report about the activity on the Marshall Island for CNN? I yeah, I could have um, easily done a report about radioactivity. Uh, I I think I touched on it like, <laughs> tangentially, but I mean the focus of my reporting for that whole year was on climate change, and so the reason I was going there was very clearly to answer this reader's question about sea level rise. I think the pushback I've gotten from editors, and I think that I get it less now after this has happened a number of times. I used to get, people are going to steal your stories, like don't tell them what you're going to do. Um, I used to get, what if something goes wrong? Like what if you're going down the river and you break your leg and you can't keep going? Or if it's really boring and like nothing happens and you don't really have a story or it's not the one that you set out to do. And my argument with that was always, we should say that, <laughs> you know, we should say this changed or we abandoned this for this reason or we're going this other direction because we think it might prove more fruitful um, and want to do right by your, you know, the topic that you commission. Um, but I've been very much in favor of like this open notebook concept of letting people see what you're doing as you're doing it. And there are risks for that. The, the one time that I, I ran into like an actual problem on the ground, um, because of that was on the inequality story. I was posting a lot on Instagram and it was this, I mean, as you saw in that intro, it's this place that was like sort of centered on a lake and there was really like a wealthy side of the lake and a poor side of the lake and they didn't interact. 
And in, in trying to do reporting on the wealthy side of the lake, some of them had found what I was posting online as I was out there reporting. Um, and thought that I was giving their town this, this bad reputation and only presenting a lot of poverty, which was, frankly, was the, just the situation there. Um, and a, a lot of people like refused to talk to me after that. They're like, we don't like that you're including, you know, these kinds of stories about our town. Um, so it, it didn't it didn't shut down the story. I still was able to get enough reporting to do it. But there are risks. You do have to think a little bit about like how are people going to take this as it's as it's coming out light. So uh, yeah, I, I've gotten a lot of pushback over the years, but it's it's gotten less and less as they've seen the the positives of doing this. Sometimes you don't, you don't get questions, you have, maybe you get statements or something. How do you validate people's statements and how does it not affect your angle on the topic? Statements like when we're, when we're asking, uh, and they can asking for a prompt. comment or something that turns your story in one way or other. How do you keep on having your objectivity on the top, topic when given all these different perspectives and comments and statements and everything. Yeah. How do you navigate uh, in this? I mean, I think it's this, I think it's similar um, to what you do when you're out reporting a story and, and you, you interview lots of people, not all of whom have a perspective that may make it into your final piece. So you may decide like, oh, this is debunked by this study and that's not a valid opinion and so I'm not going to include all of it. I mean, you're still synthesizing. I also, this is kind of like goes in a whole different direction, but I don't, I don't believe in journalistic objectivity in like a strict no, sense. I don't either, um, but but I, I think like, I think it's like you as a person in this place or doing this reporting, t you can take into account all of this stuff and then your, you know, your job is essentially to synthesize and find, you know, what, what in your heart is the fair truth. And you want to include other perspectives in that obviously, but I don't think it changes necessarily because it's like digital stuff flying at you versus like people. <laughs> you know, it's it's but a similar concept, everything. but it can be yeah. Published. <coughs> all the statements are pu published, right? So. Yeah, yeah. On, so like on social media, I tend to reply to people if they're if they're like on global warming, for example. I you know I write about that topic a, a lot still. Anytime I post about it on Facebook, I'm going to get someone who replies with. In the, from the U.S. perspective, like someone saying that the climate science is bunk, which is just not true. So I often will reply to that person and say, you know, this is not true, here's a study. Um, if it gets unwieldy, you know, I may shut down comments on a post and say that I've done that and, and for what reason. Um, but I think, like, I think you can moderate that conversation in a way that it's still productive. I think we have to, uh, to, to stop for now, um, but uh, John is going to... Uh, <laughs> <laughs>